I'm Paul Campbell, and I think you heard my biography, but I just want to remind all of you that are seniors and juniors that I work for the International Baccalaureate Organization. So those tests that you take, uh, I'm responsible for those, so behave. Um, I also want to thank uh, Carrollwood Day School, particularly Ryan Kelly, uh, a friend and somebody I admire as an independent school administrator, and Mary Cantor, uh, who also is a friend who had so much to do with making this school what it is today. I feel very comfortable here. I've been here before, had the privilege of speaking at a graduation here. But I think what really makes me comfortable is your full embrace of International Baccalaureate. Uh, one of my passions, which I'm not going to speak about today, is the way the full embrace of the IB transforms students, teachers, families, and communities. So I feel really happy when I'm in a school like this. And I feel really happy when I'm not in the office. Uh, because we always talk amongst each other and we remind each other that the IB doesn't happen in our office. It happens in your schools. And I just have to reflect on what's been a fairly amazing day. Um, I'm going to just use Akshita as an example. Uh, I remember what, what I was like in seventh grade. But I know, and I know in seventh grade I could not have gotten up in front of a group of people with such Im immense poise and confidence and purposefulness so that's a tribute to Akshita, to her family, and to what happens here every day. You don't mind if I don't use the word passion in every other sentence. I think we've kind of covered that today. I feel strongly about what I'm going to talk about, but I've been so inspired by all the other stories that I think I'll um, just confine myself to more um, basic language. Uh, I did this once before. I did it for a school in... A, uh, independent school in Spokane, Washington. And even though I, do, I speak in public all the time and rarely write a speech, I was nervous. It's something about that red carpet and the camera and the people, uh, and you're not supposed to use notes. So I was pretty confident that I could talk for the requisite 15 to 18 minutes about my topic. But at the last minute, I panicked. Uh, because I didn't trust my memory, because I'm not as young as I used to be, and I wrote topics on my hand. The only other time I did that was in eighth grade in algebra. I got caught. I should have remembered that, because about halfway through the speech, I was stuck for just a second, and I held my hand out, and I realized another effect of aging is your vision goes bad. So I was holding my hand out like this, and I couldn't read it, so clean. I actually... Um, want to talk a little bit about something that I've been thinking about almost uh, ever since I spoke at graduation. It, it kind of brought something very clear to me that has been kind of moving around in my mind all this time. You know, I, I think it's very typical for people your age and maybe people my age to be looking for meaning, to be looking for a philosophy of life, to be looking for a purpose. And I've tried on a lot of different things. I've tried all the conventional approaches, hedonism, worked for a while, materialism, cynicism, that was a good, that was a good time. Um, a love of nature, you know, I admire the faithful, but don't count myself amongst their numbers. I have a great deal of respect for religion, particularly because of how it's uh, affected social change in this country, but I'm not terribly religious, so, I'm left looking for something that can inform the way I behave every day. And it really comes down to something that I read a long, long time ago when I was your age. This book called The Road Less Travel, written by Dr. M. Scott Peck. I don't really like self-help books because I don't like being told what to do. So I rarely read past the first chapter. And I have some advice for you. If a friend or a family member gives you a self-help book, pay attention to what the topic of the book is, because they're trying to tell you something. And I was sure that in the first chapter of this book, there was something about paying attention, something about the importance of paying attention to things in your life. And I looked at the book, I picked up a copy the other day, and it was on page 120. So either I needed more help back then, or I had more persistence, because I got at least that far before I found 
something that I want to talk to you about right now. The work of paying attention. He talks about how hard it is to truly pay attention to what's in front of you, to the people in front of you, to the places in front of you, how it's much more of an effort to do that than it is to say, feel conventional romantic love, which happens to me all the time, you know, and, and can happen over and over and over again, but doesn't require much effort. But behind that love, what really sustains those relationships is when I pay attention. I'm not talking about hypervigilance. I'm not talking about eyes wide open staring at people. I'm not talking about, you know, um, oversensitivity. I'm not talking about paranoia. I'm just talking about noticing what people are saying to you, either with their words or with their actions or with their gestures. And I realize how hard it is because I've recommitted myself to it. And I'm up to about an hour and a half a day. And I'll explain that in a second. And I'm exhausted at the end of that hour and a half. It's much harder to do that than some of the other things that I do every day. Because I feel like I'm working on a muscle that's atrophied. And I know a lot of you think you do this. You think you pay attention. But I challenge you to think about what it really is to pay attention. You have to put aside distractions. You have to put aside devices. And you have to listen intently. Paying attention is much more about listening than it is about talking. I'm much more of a talker than I am a listener. Fortunately, I have a 15-year-old that keeps me in check. But it is hard to listen because when you listen, you have to watch, you have to learn, you have to pick up the nuances of what people are trying to tell you. So I thought I'd start small because I'm talking about emotional intelligence here and I'm talking about something that's a little bit hard to grasp and hard to exercise every day. But there are places that you can pay attention. Everybody can do this. Let's start with the road. How many of you drive? No, no, it's not gonna go over very well. All right, how many of you, you still be driving, and I'm sure you've heard all the horror stories about driving around here or driving around Washington, D.C., where I live. But I moved down there from New York City where I didn't have to drive much. I immediately recognized that I was kind of getting really, really angry when I was driving. I was having what they call road rage. You know, somebody would do something, they'd honk at me or something like that, and I'd just explode. And I, I did one thing one day, which really made me worry because I was at a corner where you're allowed to turn right on red, but it was an intersection where somebody could be coming across. So I was waiting, the guy behind me honked. <laughs> what I did is I started going about five miles per hour and blocking his way. Now, I don't know, this guy could have been anybody. He could have been armed, he could have been dangerous. And I thought, wow, you know, I just need to take a deep breath. And I started looking forward when I was driving. I started looking at what was happening a block away or two blocks away. And I started paying attention to that. I started realizing that I could react to it before I got into those situations. And you'd have this kind of wonderful experience of going with the flow and no knowing that you've avoided getting in a jam. And if everybody did this, wouldn't the world be wonderful? And it seemed simple, but it really did take work. You know, I had to stop doing all the other things I was doing in my mind and with my mouth and with my phone. Uh, so when you guys start to drive, and I know you're gonna learn this in drive red, then you're gonna promptly forget it, and you're gonna get angry on the road. Just pay attention to something that's going on a little ways down the road. And imagine what it would be like if everybody did that. What it would be like to drive around. When you're walking in the hallway, you're gonna see something if you're paying attention that you wouldn't see otherwise. It's gonna be somebody who needs some help. Somebody who's carrying something that needs help, some door that needs to be opened. These are opportunities for grace, both to receive and to give grace. And there are dozens of these opportunities every day. And when you pay attention and you notice those opportunities and you take them, you feel really good about yourself. This is not about random acts of kindness. This is not about being a good Samaritan. This is actually enlightened self-interest. This is something you do for yourself that helps others. When I lived in New York, it was easy. For those of you that end up living in a big city, walk the streets, there's always gonna be a woman with a stroller who's going down the stairs to the subway, or an older person who's carrying three bags, or somebody 
who stumbles. Or some crazy New Yorker who's in such a hurry because he's so important that he wants to plow you over and you just step aside and say, that's fine. You know, you pay attention in that way. So you start with the road, and then you go to the, hall, the hallways of your school, uh, and then you, know, you take it onto the streets of the city you live in when you're older. The hardest part is when you're dealing with people. Uh, he talks a lot about the difficulty of attention as an aspect of love. It's very easy to say, I love you, and I go out of my way to say it to my wife and daughter every day. But when I have to pay attention to them and not get stressed out by their needs, and not put them into my mix and say, well, you think you got problems, I really got problems, you know? Not get competitive about who's more stressed out or who's more you know, busy or who's contributing more. Don't keep score. Just pay attention. I think you know, because you probably know each other fairly well in a school this size, that a lot of you have ver uh, verbal, nonverbal cues. You know when your friends are in trouble. You know when something's bothering them. You know them well enough, if you're paying attention, to stop and ask them if they want to talk about it and then to listen to them. So I, I think that when you read this book, which I'm sure you will, you know, you'll, you'll realize that um, this is just like uh, Lily swimming. This is just like any other discipline that you, whether it be music, sport, school, but it's incredibly rewarding because I'll tell you one story um, about what happens sometimes when you pay attention. Because I get to meet a lot of teachers, and I get to go to a lot of schools. Uh, you know, I met a young teacher recently from Canada who was writing a thesis, a uh, master's thesis about the IV. And I thought that was fascinating. And I paid attention to her when she sat down and asked me questions. And I started to pick up everything about it that was bothering her, that was frustrating her. And over the course of a few weeks, we talked about it over and over again. And she kind of got over that point. And she finished her thesis, and she defended it. And of course, it was accepted. And she said to me, it was because you paid attention. And I didn't really think I was doing something that extraordinary. I didn't really remember doing it consciously. But I do remember listening. I do remember looking, I do remember reading, I do remember encouraging, and I think those things are underrated. I think we get too much into what can I get versus what this person can get. Uh, I really encourage you to do this for yourself and not worry about what other people are doing. Maybe it'll become infectious. If your friends see you doing this, It'll become something that more and more people want to do. The roads will be safer. The school will be safer. Some of the stories we've heard today about the challenges of being a high school student and adolescence will be safer because we'll be exercising that muscle of paying attention. Thank you.